It seems like whenever I talk with friends, family, or even a lot of journalists in the automotive industry about General Motors' least expensive EVs in America, the conversation usually goes something like this. So what do you really think about the Chevy Bolt? I don't know, I don't like the Bolt or the Bolt EV. They're just not as nice as a Model 3. You know, they're, they're smaller, it's not as much fun, it's not as fast, it doesn't go quite as far. It's just, it's just not as nice. And my response usually goes something like this. No shit, Sherlock, what'd you expect? The Chevy Bolt starts at $26,500. Of course it's not gonna be as good as an electric car that costs 15, 20, $30,000 more expensive. This, right here, this Bolt EUV is still far less expensive than the average new vehicle in America or the average electric vehicle in America. So set your expectations accordingly. Now, if that's all you need to know about the Bolt and this Bolt EUV, then you can check out our other videos on the channel. For the detailed explanation of why you still want to look at a Bolt EUV, that's what this video is about. Here's the deal. The design mission of the Bolt and the Bolt EUV was very different than the EVs that usually occupy the headlines, like the Model 3 or a Polestar 2 or Kia's new EV6 that happens to also be sitting in my driveway. This was designed to be an efficient, pragmatic, and most importantly, an affordable electric vehicle. And even though we've seen price tags rise on a wide variety of electric vehicles in the US, and I wouldn't be surprised if the price tag escalated for the 2024 model year, the Bolt is one of the least expensive EVs available in America. It starts right around $26,000. The Bolt EUV is a little bit more pragmatic and a little bit more expensive, but still significantly less expensive than pretty much anything else in the EV space right now. Now, obviously, there are going to be trade-offs, and that's what this video is going to talk about. This is not the same thing as an ID4 or a BZ4X or a Solterra or that next step up in size and price tag. Instead, the most direct competitor to this is going to be the Hyundai Kona EV, perhaps the Kia Niro EV, and maybe, if you really stretch things, the old Nissan Leaf. Unless you park the Bolt and the Bolt EUV next to each other, you're probably not going to notice the difference. They both look like the post-refresh Bolt with some subtle changes to the EUV model. Up here we have daytime running lights and turn signals. Down here we have headlights. There's sort of an imitation grill insert right there, and then all the cooling happens at the bottom. Now this is a subcompact vehicle, so it's going to be significantly narrower than something like a RAV4 or a CRV. Again, very, very similar to the Kona EV. Now the next thing we should talk about is the elephant in the room, which is the battery pack situation in the Bolt and Bolt EUV. General Motors, after a six-month hiatus, has restarted Bolt and Bolt EUV production, so you will be able to buy these on dealer lots right about now. The issue going on was that there was a manufacturing defect in the cell modules of the battery pack. Not every Bolt was affected, but to be sure, General Motors is recalling them all, so that way the battery packs can be inspected and then replaced if necessary. This battery pack has undergone the increased inspection process, so all new Bolts and Bolts EUVs, or whatever you want to call them, Bolt EUVs, they don't have that battery pack problem. If you're currently shopping for a new electric vehicle in the US, you should know that there have been some significant changes to the tax credit scheme recently. Most importantly, the most direct competitor to this, the Hyundai Kona, has lost its federal tax credit. But come January 1st, 2023, the Bolt and the Bolt EUV will regain their tax credit because there's no longer going to be a cap on the number of electric vehicles a manufacturer can sell. However, they will need to be built in North America. And the Bolt and the Bolt EUV are, the Kona is not, neither is the Kia Nero. If you think you might qualify for all or most of that federal tax credit, $7,500, this is going to be one of the least expensive new electric vehicles on sale in America. The regular Bolt currently starts at $25,600 plus tax title license and destination. This starts at $33,500. So it is going to be significantly less expensive come January 1st, 2023. If I were you and I could wait, then I would certainly wait for next year. At this point in time, General Motors does not seem to be raising prices on the Bolt and Bolt EUV. In fact, they recently dropped it about $6,000. So this is still one of the least expensive ways to get into a new efficient electric car. Coming in at 169 and a half inches, this is 6.3 inches longer than the Bolt without the little EUV logo right there. Since this is subcompact hatch masquerading as a crossover, we find body cladding on the front and rear wheel wells and a style that is slightly different than the regular Bolt. 
Ground clearance is largely the same. If you're looking for an EV with more ground clearance, you're probably gonna want one with all wheel drive also, so this might not fit the bill. Most of the size increase versus the regular Bolt happens right back here in the rear passenger area in terms of legroom and in terms of slightly tweaked seat geometry. So even though the legroom figures are larger than the regular Bolt, it feels even roomier than those leg numbers would otherwise indicate because of the way they've massaged the seating position around a bit. Moving right back here, we have a very similar style to what we find in the regular Bolt, but again, massaged slightly. And we find a rear bumper overhang that is slightly longer than the regular Bolt. So a little bit of the stretch happens right back here in the rear. Importantly though, none of the stretch happens in the cargo area. It's essentially the same size as the regular Bolt. Continuing the wannabe crossover theme, Chevy also gives us two-tone load bars on the roof. Be sure and let me know what you think about the design of the EUV in the comment section. This is certainly more attractive and less polarizing than the original Bolt, and I think a little bit more attractive to my eye than the current generation Kona. Back here we have full LED tail lamp modules, which is a bit of a surprise. These are the parking lights. Down here we have the brake lights and the turn signals. The reverse light is right down there at the bottom of the bumper. The lower portion of the bumper definitely has some of those wannabe crossover styling elements with the silver section at the bottom, lots of black cladding right there. And then we find the center brake light right there above the hatch. If you're interested in a rear window wiper, I know some people are really, really into that. Then we do have one here, although it is pretty tiny. Some folks have incorrectly accused the Bolt and the Bolt EV as simply being an electric conversion of an existing GM vehicle. That's not true. Even though this shares some suspension components and some crash structure components with other GM small vehicles worldwide, most of the Bolt and the Bolt EV are very unique. And the big reason for that is the battery pack. Chevy wanted to put a big, big battery in a really small vehicle. This is a 65 kilowatt hour battery pack in a subcompact car that is significantly narrower and significantly shorter than something like an ID4, which doesn't have a battery pack that much bigger than this one. And that's part of why this is so efficient because it's big battery, tiny packaging with a lot of focus on light weighting and efficiency. Under the hood, we do find the electric motor. This is a front wheel drive vehicle, which is most efficient as far as a single motor vehicle goes because the front motor is gonna be doing most of the regen in a dual motor setup. So when you go single motor, a lot of manufacturers wanna put that single motor right up front. This produces 200 horsepower, 266 pound feet of torque. And thanks to that big battery pack, you'll get 267 miles of range in the city, 233 on the highway, 247 combined for the Bolt EUV. That is a little bit below the regular Bolt. That's rated for 280 city, 233 highway, and 259 combined. But in real world driving, you'd be hard pressed to tell the difference. The battery pack is charged via an onboard 11 kilowatt level two charger. You'll find that door right up here just in front of the driver's door. We find a J1772 connector and a CCSDC fast charge connector. An 11 kilowatt onboard charger is pretty quick for an inexpensive vehicle like this. And it means that if you have a 11 kilowatt EVSE at home, you can recharge this battery in about seven hours from completely empty. DC fast charging, that is on the slower side of things, 55 kilowatts peak for this vehicle. When I was planning this video, I really didn't intend it to be a defense of the Bolt and Bolt EUV, but if that's what this is turning into, let's just dive right on in. One of the other areas that I think people get a little bit lost when comparing this EV to that EV is the DC fast charge speed. 55 kilowatts is certainly not as impressive as the peak rate in an EV6 or an Ionic 5, but efficiency is a huge factor to consider because over a week of mixed driving in this vehicle, I've been averaging 4.3 miles per kilowatt hour, making this the most efficient electric vehicle that I have ever tested here at Alex and Autos. In my same driving test, this is more efficient than the base version of the Tesla Model 3 that we owned for a while. That is seriously impressive, and it's all due to the design, the skinny tires, the light curb weight, etc., and the smaller battery pack. Now, because efficiency is high, you will go further on an hour of charging than in pretty much any other EV out there, almost regardless of the kind of charging that you're doing. AC charging, significantly faster. This has a really fast onboard charger, 11 kilowatts. That means that in one hour of charging, you'll gain 45 miles of driving range. That is really impressive. If you have access only to a 120 volt level one EVSC, this is still going to gain range at around 4.5 miles per hour of charging if you can charge at the max rate for 120 volts. On DC fast charging, 
30 minute session will give you about 100 to 115 miles of real world driving range. That is not as impressive as an EV6 admittedly. 18 minutes there will get you more than 100 miles of driving, but that's gonna cost a lot more. Obviously, this is not gonna be an ideal choice if you wanna wake up one random Wednesday and drive from San Francisco to New York. But for longer interstate drives, this might just be fine because you could definitely go from San Antonio to Houston or San Francisco to Los Angeles with relative ease. You may need to stop to DC fast charge, but you may not even need to stop for 30 minutes because the first battery will get you about 250 miles. Then you stop for 30 minutes, have a break, get an extra 100 miles of range, kick it on into that destination that's 350 or perhaps even 400 miles away, depending on how you're driving it. The other interesting reality is that this is one of the few new EVs that I would recommend buying if you don't have the ability or you are not interested in installing a level two charger. If you only have a 110 volt or 115 volt outlet at home, this could work just fine. And I know that because my next door neighbor right that way has an original bolt and that's exactly what he does, even though his daily commutes around 30 miles each way. He does not have the ability to charge at the office, and here's how it goes. He starts the week with a full battery, and then progressively each day of the week, the battery is a little bit lower, a little bit lower, a little bit lower, because at night, he can't quite get back to 100%. But that's fine because by the time Friday rolls around, the battery leaves his house at about 50% range, still more than comfortable in terms of getting to the office and getting back home. And then over the weekend, the battery fills all the way up to full because the battery is not very big. And that's the important thing. On a recent towing trial with the Lightning and the Rivian, it took almost a full week for me at home on a 120 volt outlet to get that vehicle back to full. With this, it takes considerably less time because the battery is an awful lot smaller. And that's why efficiency is important. If you don't have the ability to install that level two or just no interest in cost in spending that extra money to install a level two, you're going to want something ultra efficient like this. Front seat comfort is pretty similar to the average small vehicle in America. I found the driver's seat and passenger seat to be pretty comfortable over a week of driving, but you should know that the seat bottom cushion is not as wide as the average compact crossover and not as long either. On the other hand, if you're looking for a smaller seat because you're a smaller person, then this might be more comfortable. This back seat is surprisingly roomy for a subcompact crossover or a subcompact hatch. Obviously, that qualification has to be mentioned. I have gobs of legroom. This is the kind of vehicle where if you were a little bit shorter than I am, you might be able to put a rear facing child seat behind someone driving the vehicle. You certainly could on the passenger side because the passenger could move a little bit further forward. But putting one in the middle, that's gonna be tricky because this rear bench is pretty darn narrow. From this seating position, I can just barely reach over, not really lean over too much and absolutely touch the door to my right. Not a lot of width going on back here, but a surprising amount of legroom. And in terms of headroom, if I sit in a natural position, I have about half an inch of headroom left, but if I try and put my head back to the headrest, I do have to kind of crane my head to one side. You will notice the amount of legroom back here if I scoot all the way over to the right. This front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I still have about an inch and a half left. If you haven't spent much time in a regular Bolt and you hop into the EUV, you might be confused about exactly what the change is. We get several inches more legroom and the rear seating position has been changed just a little bit. It's very difficult to tell, mind you, but the rear seat feels a little bit higher off the ground and that means that adults might find this a bit more comfortable. It doesn't mean that your legs are really up in the air or practically in your chest. But again, not a lot of width to this cabin. Center console is pretty darn small right up there between the driver and front passenger seats. You'll really notice that if you try and stuff three people across the rear. It's not the leg room, it's not even the headroom here in the middle. It certainly is the fact that you're really gonna be hip to hip back here. One of the more surprising things about the EUV, I say surprising, you might say disappointing, is that we don't actually have any more cargo capacity back here than in the regular Bolt. In fact, we have a teeny tiny amount less, 16.3 cubic feet of cargo space versus 16.6. That simply has to do with the way that they've styled the rear end, and some of that again is where we find the extra length, and some also has to do with the way that the rear seats have been rearranged a bit. The focus for the extension of the Bolt was rear seat accommodation, not cargo room. In case you're wondering, hitches are available for the Bolt and Bolt EUV, and this is theoretically rated to tow 2,000 pounds. One weird twist though, we have a center mounted backup light, and that is positioned right where I would want the hitch to come out of the bumper. 
When it comes to cargo practicality, this vehicle punches a little above its weight because under this load floor, you can put two 22 inch roller bags. And if I take out this divider and take out this bag, I was able to squeeze four 24 inch roller bags back here because of how deep and how square the cargo area is. Going further down the rabbit hole, we find what kind of looks like a subwoofer, but this is in fact the electronics module for the optional super cruise system. And then we find a very small storage area where you can keep your EVSC. This is the kind of vehicle where you could easily put a spare tire under the load floor if you wanted to, and then still have a flat load floor for daily use. As we look around this interior together, you should keep in mind that this model has an MSRP of around $42,000 because we have things like this optional dual pane power moonroof. Only this front section opens. The back section is just a fixed piece of glass. Moving down from the ceiling, we have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, two-way adjustable headrests. The materials on the front and rear doors look very, very similar, as does the design, but we get more premium materials on the front door. So this upper gray section here, this is a soft touch piece of plastic in the front section, while the upper section of the rear doors is a hard material, but that lighter colored section on the mid portion of the door, that's a soft touch plastic, and then all the doors have hard plastics down there towards the bottom to help improve durability. You can see that we have perforated seats in the rear and in the front, but only the front seats are ventilated. They have a really attractive triangle pattern to them. Let me know what you think about that. There's also a little bit of extra piping to help dress things up, and then some yellow stitching around the gray elements on the headrest and on the seat back and on the seat bottom cushion as well. Moving all the way over to the front door, as you can see that decently sized storage cubby right down there at the bottom of the door. On the dashboard, we have generally speaking more premium materials than we find in the average subcompact in the US. This white section right here mimics what's going on with the seats, although these are just dimples, they're not perforations. We then have harder plastics down towards the bottom of the dash, including that glove compartment lid. This is a bin style glove compartment. I was able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside. Surprisingly, the upper section of the dash, this is all a soft touch injection molded piece, which is definitely more premium than I had expected. We then have large air vents around the dash, two on each side there, and then two more in the middle. Well, speaking about air vents, you should know that the rear passengers don't get any, but they do get two USB charge only ports. Below the two air vents in the center of the dashboard, we find a standard large touchscreen infotainment system. This is not running the absolute latest version of GM's operating system, but oddly enough, it is a lot snappier than other versions that may have a software that looks pretty similar to this. You'll really notice the difference when you start loading screens and going from option to option that this transitions more rapidly than say the last generation Silverado. We get a decent amount of information about where the battery pack is sending power, whether uh, it's going to things like driving accessories, climate, battery conditioning, etc. This impact screen is also kind of handy. It will basically tell you since the last full charge, what's been going on. This has spent a lot of time idling while we're filming. So obviously climate has chewed through nine miles of driving range. Outside temperature, it's been pretty mild. So it actually says it's given us a bump of 0.6 miles. The terrain, oddly, uh, this has been going up and down mountain passes. It thinks that's actually a good thing. And then driving technique, pretty uh, minimal there. You can see driving history there over here on the charging screen. You can roll through charging options. You can adjust the target charge level. You can adjust how much current it's going to draw through a level one charge cord but only between eight and 12 amps. So you can't fine tune it there. And interestingly, it's always going to try and snap back to eight amps. You can, however, use location-based charging. That is kind of handy. And you can choose whether you want to get charging estimates for level one, level two, or both of them. And you will see those right here on this screen. So right now, if I were to plug in, the battery would be completely charged, even with a level one charge cord by tomorrow at 6 a.m. And if I plug this in right now, it would be fully charged in about two hours. So pretty swift charging. If you had a level two, that would max out that rate, of course. There's a little knob over here. If you would rather use the knob to interact with the system, I'm not the biggest fan of that. And then you'll find the start stop button for the vehicle over there on that side. Below that, we have the controls for the two zone automatic climate control. If you'd rather use the touch screen to interact with some of the climate control settings, you can hit that button and then adjust things up there. You can turn the heat on and off if you wanna save some battery power in the winter. And one nice touch, we have 
ventilated seats up front that really helps you save energy in the summer. They are automatic, so that way they will automatically turn on if it's hot outside, and they're really quiet. I like that feature. Below this, we have two USB ports. They both work with the system. There's also a 12 volt power port, Qi wireless charging mat there. There's a sport mode button, lane centering button, traction control button there. We have the kind of toggle switch sort of shifter that we've seen in some other GM vehicles. Pull for drive there, push for neutral, pull for reverse. This is the one pedal drive mode button and that's park right there. We have two sort of medium sized cup holders. You can fit some of the larger takeout drinks, but not all of them in those cup holders. And if I pull the camera up to the ceiling, you'll see how narrow this center console really is, as is this tiny little armrest between the two seats and this itty bitty little storage cubby. It's narrow enough that my large iPhone fills the entire area right there on the bottom. You couldn't put anything wider than that inside. If you're looking for more storage space, you'll find that underneath the center console, there's actually a pretty large storage area there. You could put purses, small bags, things like that in that area and not have them move around. Over on the driver's side, we find a somewhat small LCD instrument cluster, although I was just driving a Lexus RX, the brand new one, and it had this exact same size screen. So I guess you could say this has the same size screen as a $60,000 luxury car. The software is just about as configurable as other GM vehicles with LCD clusters, definitely a feature that I like. And there are two basic looks for this LCD. You can have a modern look or you can have an enhanced look. I prefer the enhanced look because it'll actually give you readouts for how much power is coming out of or going into the battery. Another really cool touch is the gasometer here for range. They tell you 187, but if you start driving it nicely, you can get up to 219. And if you start driving it like an idiot, you'll be down here by 150. Moving out from the instrument cluster, we find a steering wheel with this little black bar right on top because this is the active light bar for Super Cruise. This is one of the few GM vehicles that has Super Cruise basically borrowed right out of the Cadillac lineup. But there's an important thing to know. This is not the latest version of Super Cruise that you will find in the Escalade and in the Cadillac Lyric. This is one generation behind that, so it's not quite as smooth on the road and it won't do automated lane changes, but this is better than the Active Glide system or the Blue Cruise system, and this is only one of a few systems that will let you truly drive hands off the steering wheel on limited access highways. This is part of the driver attention monitoring system right there. Then on the back of the steering wheel, we have a regen paddle. This does not let you adjust the amount of throttle lift off regen you get. Instead, you pull the paddle, it will max out the regen, take you to a complete stop. So you can really think of it as more of a braking pedal. Then on the back of the steering wheel, we find some infotainment buttons, volume up, down on the right side track up down over here on the left side. The controls for the adaptive cruise control system and super cruise system are right over here on this side. Then on this side, we find some controls for things like the voice command, phone hang up pickup button, and then this rotary knob controls that multifunction LCD. As far as the steering wheel itself goes, there's a slight flat bottom, which makes it a little easier to get in and out of the vehicle. And I like the fact that the rim is pretty thick here. Let me know what you think about that. If you prefer a really skinny steering wheel, you might not like this one, but I like the position of the hand rests and the finger rests there. I think I like the width of the steering wheel as well. Out on the road, you can think of the EUV as the slightly larger, slightly softer, and slightly slower bolt, but all of those are very, very slight. Zero to 60 in this model was 6.6 .6 seconds. I was able to clock 6.5 seconds in a 2022 bolt from a Chevy dealer. Uh, so not a big difference there. In terms of 60 to zero stopping distance, that was a little bit larger. This one stopped in 130 feet versus 125 feet for the regular bolt logically because this vehicle is heavier. I think those are reasonable trade-offs for the extra room that we get in the back. I think that the Bolt and the Bolt EUV could have a sporty version if they wanted to. This could be, you know, the electric GTI if you were to put wider grippier tires and maybe some slightly different springs and dampers on the vehicle. A Bolt with summer tires, maybe 225 with summer tires would be an absolute blast on your favorite winding mountain road. Now, logically, that would take away from the efficiency mission, but I think it would be a worthwhile trade-off to give a version of the Bolt slightly better handling. Let me know what you think about that as well. Am I crazy? Am I not crazy there? But this does, again, handle very well. It has a lot of potential, but when you compare this against ICE, competitors, this is not going to handle as well as a decent number of them, especially keeping in mind the price tag of this vehicle. This is bumping up against the more expensive variants and better handling variants of other subcompact entries in the US. When it comes to the ride quality score, I'm gonna give this an A. Out on a rougher road surface like the one that I'm on here, this does a really good job of soaking up large imperfections and small imperfections, 
It drives like a bigger vehicle, and you can likely thank the added weight of the battery pack for that. This is logically going to be heavier than the base version of a Kia Soul or something along those lines, because we have that fairly large battery right underneath me. But Chevy also did a good job tuning the suspension to help soak up some of the bumps. So we have a little bit more suspension travel in this suspension design than you'll find in some competitive small vehicles. And that means that at higher speeds, larger imperfections don't unsettle the suspension. If you're looking for a quiet entry-level vehicle, you want to put the Bolt and the Bolt EUV on your shopping list. At 50 miles an hour in this EUV, I measured 71 decibels. That easily makes this one of the quietest entry-level vehicles in North America. A lot of that has to do with the battery pack and its positioning right underneath me. That helps isolate a lot of sound from coming into the cabin. We also have relatively skinny tires, as I mentioned before. Skinnier tires just don't generate as much road noise. And of course, the tire compound on low rolling resistance tires also tend to be a little bit quieter. Where the Bolt really shines is efficiency. I've been averaging over a week of mixed driving 4.3 miles per kilowatt hour. That is absolutely excellent. And it includes the idling when it was being videoed, when we were doing photos of it, all the zero to 60 testing and braking testing, etc. Still averaged 4.3 miles per kilowatt hour. The lifetime average for this exact Bolt EUV is 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour, and a lot of people have been driving it harder, letting it idle, photo shoots, etc., preconditioning when the vehicle was stopped. All that factors into that lifetime 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour. That is a very, very impressive number. Now, this does not have a heat pump, so if you live in a colder climate, you should know that your efficiency numbers are going to drop significantly in the winter. As far as efficiency goes, this is fantastic compared against pretty much everything else out there. There are a few electric vehicles that will score similarly in the EPA tests, base versions of some Tesla models, the Hyundai Kona, etc. But this managed to beat the Kona in real world driving in my testing, and it also significantly outperformed the base version of the Tesla Model 3 the last time I drove one. Now that efficiency number really shouldn't surprise too much because the Bolt is pretty small. I can reach over here while I'm sitting in an upright position and my hand is only about a quarter of an inch from that door panel on the other side of the car. This is a very small vehicle and that means that aerodynamics are going to be simply better here. The aerodynamic drag at higher speeds is going to be lower in this than in a wide variety of vehicles. Even something only slightly larger, or it would appear only slightly larger, like a Nero EV or a BZ4X or something like that, this is going to be more efficient at higher speeds. And I haven't been sparing the whip. I've been driving this just like I drive every other vehicle on my daily commute. Now, in my road trip range test, I actually managed to get 250 miles of real world range. This had no problem completing that loop, even though the highway range figure of this vehicle was slightly below that road trip range test mileage total. Unfortunately, I had some GoPro issues and I lost most of the footage for that road trip range test, so I'm not going to have a separate video simply on that. But I will say this was fantastically efficient on that road trip range test. If you're in the market for a new electric vehicle and your priorities are price tag, efficiency, and pragmatism, the Bolt and Bolt EUV absolutely should be on your shopping list. And I think the EUV is worth the small price bump over the regular Bolt because the back seat is certainly more accommodating. I also like the styling a bit more than the regular Bolt. And weirdly enough, even though the EPA numbers are a little bit lower for this than the Bolt, in real world driving, the difference is almost non-existent. This will still get over four miles per kilowatt hour even if you drive it a little bit more aggressively or you live in a hilly climate. I go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass and I still got over four miles per kilowatt hour on average. This is incredibly efficient compared to basically every other new EV that's coming out on the market soon because all of the new EVs that we're gonna be seeing over the next year or two seem to be more focused on luxury or performance or some blend of those than high efficiency. If you are in the market, and efficiency is of prime concern, regardless of why. You just wanna use less energy, you want to charge faster on a slower charging connector effectively, this is going to be a great option. Because as I said earlier, if you're in a situation where you can't or you don't want to install a 240 volt EVSE at home, you will likely be able to do just fine with a level one EVSE on this vehicle. I have done that this entire week. I've just charged it at home. I live off the grid. This is the kind of vehicle that could work for my off-grid living situation because this uses less than half the power 
for me to commute daily in than something like a Rivian or even a Kia EV6. That's still gonna consume 50% more power on average than this Bolt EUV right here. So if you're in a situation where you're really concerned about your power consumption, your power rates are high, charging might be tricky, you're gonna to want to focus on efficiency. You're gonna want something like this Bolt EUV. Now, you're gonna want something different if you want a bigger cargo area, if you want a bigger back seat, if you regularly seat five, the fifth seat is pretty tight, although legroom generally is pretty good, or if you want those faster DC fast charging speeds. If you really do find yourself regularly going long distances between cities, say you're crossing Texas, crossing California, going up the Eastern seaboard, et cetera, you're probably gonna want something that will DC fast charge faster. But if you rarely do it, you only occasionally, maybe once a year, want to make a trip that's 300 or 400 miles long, you will be just fine in the Bolt and the Bolt EV. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. Find me at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those social places, and stay tuned for more of an off-grid focused video on this Chevy right here, because this is, again, one of the few EVs that I could actually live with. Also on that list would be something like the Kona EV, because it's very low in consumption as well, or a rear-wheel drive EV6, or some of the ultra-efficient Tesla models, although in real-world driving, they're actually going to consume more weekly than this. That's going to be in that video. I'll see all of you later.